Green Head of Rural Property at Shepherd and Weatherburn, and I have pleasure in welcoming you to the latest edition of the series of Resolving Rural Disputes webinars that the, the Rural Disputes team at Shepherd and Weatherburn have been hosting over the course of the summer. My topic today is contract farming disputes and common problems and perhaps ways of addressing them. Uh, and I'll have a look at managing and resolving those disputes uh, and the sorts of disputes that arise between the farmer and the contractor. I'm presuming, of course, that everyone in this audience has a basic knowledge of contract farming agreements and their use is relatively widespread in Scotland, both in an arable and a livestock context. And at its simplest, uh, a contract farming agreement is a commercial agreement for the provision of services between a farmer and the contractor. The goal of the contract farming agreement, uh, at least from the farmer's perspective, is that the farmer retains control of the farming operations and retains his or her, her status as an active farmer. And that involves participating in the financial risk of the, the farming business but the farming operations themselves are carried out by the, the contractor. And it has been my experience that a successful contract farming agreement involves a high degree of trust and goodwill between the farmer and the contractor. Without that trust and goodwill in the first place, amplified by good behaviour on the part of both parties, then no matter how well drawn up the contract farming agreement is, the relationship is likely to end unhappily. Uh, and contract farming agreements can go badly wrong. Uh, I was involved in a case where the contractor attempted to argue that a series of contract farming agreements were not what they purported to be and that they actually were designed to hide the true relationship between the parties, which was that of landlord and tenant. Now, this was a dispute which predated the introduction of fixed duration tenancies by the Agricultural Holding Scotland Act 2003. And therefore, had the contractor been successful, it would have established a fully secure agricultural tenancy in its favour. Now, ultimately, that attempt failed, not least of all because of the difficulty in persuading the court that a contracting agreement was actually a sham, i.e. a conscious, deliberate effort by both parties to hide the true nature of the relationship. The evidence to support such an argument was lacking in that particular case, and in fact, in my view, uh, would be very difficult to establish in any case. Now, of course, the risks of ch challenge uh, along those lines are now very much reduced because even if successful, uh, the contractor would obtain at best a fixed duration tenancy under the 2003 Act, which the farmer would be able to bring to an end at a definite date in the future. However, that's not really the topic of my talk today. Um, where disputes do arise between the parties and the contract farming agreement, it'll be in the day-to-day -day workings of the contract itself. Uh, they might involve how a contractor is fulfilling its responsibilities uh, and the standard of husbandry on the land being carried out by the contractor, or it might be something to do with the accounting aspects of a contracting agreement. If the farmer has to reimburse the contractor for inputs, is the farmer doing so timelessly? If the farmer is operating a number two account to pay inputs and to receive sales income, is the number two account properly funded and are suppliers being paid on time? Is that impacting on the ability uh, of the contractor to obtain seed and fertilizer? I have had a case where the contractor suffered by association with the farmer who had a poor credit score. Suppliers were reluctant to supply the farmer and the contractor found that they were being tarred with the same brush, which had a knock-on effect in respect of their other farming businesses elsewhere. Are the accounting arrangements at the end of each contracting year being dealt with efficiently and within uh, agreed timescales? And are the parties satisfied that the net divisible surplus is being calculated fairly? Uh, and is it being paid on time to the contractor? 
These are just a few examples of the areas in a contract farming agreement where the parties can fall out. It's in the interest of both parties, therefore, that a well-drawn-up contract farming agreement has a clause that allows either the farmer or the contractor to bring the contract to an end because of bad behaviour by the other party. Now, ideally, such provisions should identify uh, clearly what behaviour will justify one of the parties bringing the arrangement to an end, uh, and it should also contain clear provisions with regard to how a final accounting between the parties uh, is achieved. If there isn't such a clause in the contract farming agreement, it becomes very much more difficult for the aggrieved party to extricate themselves from the contract farming arrangement itself. The next problem uh, is to resolve what happens if the parties are in disagreement about how the contract farming agreement should be interpreted. It could, of course, be something as dramatic as behaviour that would justify one partner uh, bringing the agreement to an end. But there may be a genuine disagreement between farmer and contractor about the particular interpretation of a clause in the contract farming agreement, which doesn't put in danger the overall relationship itself. Uh, that might be an agreement about the calculation of the divisible surplus, for example. Now, the solution to a problem like that is to have a contract farming agreement that is crystal clear in all respects. But of course, in the real world, it's perfectly po possible for parties behaving reasonably to have genuine disagreements about the interpretation of particular clauses. The question then is, how do they resolve those differences uh, and disagreements? Most contract farming agreements uh, will, or at least should, contain an arbitration clause. And such a clause is, in my view, extremely important. In the absence of a clause referring a dispute to arbitration, if the parties fail to agree how to resolve something themselves, the alternative is to resolve matters in the ordinary courts with the expense and also the publicity, possibly adverse publicity, that that would involve. A well-drawn arbitration clause will provide that the parties, if they are in dispute and cannot agree themselves about how to interpret any particular part of the contract farming agreement, or indeed uh, if the agreement should be brought to an end because of alleged fault on the part of one party or the other, they can then refer the dispute to an arbiter to be mutually chosen between them. If they can't agree on the appointment of a suitable arbiter, then there should be a mechanism within the arbitration clause itself that allows one or both of the parties to apply to an external body for the appointment of an arbiter. I often see, for example, a clause providing for an arbiter to be appointed by the chairman for the time being of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors in Scotland, uh, or, or some uh, similar body. In summary then, a contract farming agreement is simply a commercial contract for the provision of services by the contractor to the farmer. The secret of its success will depend on the level of trust and goodwill between the farmer and the contractor in the first place. The possibility of disputes arising can never be ruled out, of course, but the contract farming agreement should be clear-cut and easily understood in respect of its provisions to reduce the scope of disagreement. And finally, the contract agreement should contain a robust clause allowing the parties to have their disputes, should any arise, resolved by arbitration in the event that they can't agree a solution themselves. That was quite a rapid dash through disputes arising from contract farming uh, agreements. I hope that it's been helpful. I'd be very happy to answer any particular or specific questions or, or indeed advise on cases that anybody might have. Uh, and I'd also recommend to you the next webinar in our series, uh, which is being presented by Elaine Brailsford and Stephanie Hepburn. And it's all to do with open water swimming, access rights and occupiers liability. I hope that you'll be able to join them then. Uh, and thank you for listening to my talk today. Goodbye.